Hello, YouTube world. This is Miss Patty with For Your CNA, and we're here for our live CNA question and answer session where we go live every Thursday at three to answer your questions. We'll give everybody just a couple minutes to get in. Uh, when you get in, just uh, send me a hello or a wave so I know that you're here. And while we wait for everybody to trickle in, um, there's, I usually give a little lesson when we first start while we're waiting for everybody. So today I want to talk about a question that came up on our YouTube comments. And this question, um, was regarding the test. How many questions can you miss on the written and how many things can you miss on the skills and still pass? Now, I wish I could give you a very simple answer for this. I wish I could say, well, if you miss X amount of questions on the written, you'll still pass. But it's not quite that easy. Um, same thing with the skills. You can't, there, there is no magic number of steps that you can miss and still pass. So let me explain the grading um, briefly. Now, I could spend an entire hour on this, and I'm not going to. I'm going to try to condense it and ex just kind of give you a little overview, explain it very briefly. So with the written test, there are five categories of questions that you're going to be asked. In fact, this right here is the test plan that's published by Prometric, which is the testing agency. So the way that the um, questions are distributed is that 20% of your questions is going to be on the role of the nurse aide. So the role of the nurse aide is, um, you know, it's all about not going beyond your scope of practice, understanding how you, um, you know, how you know what to do with each patient, understanding what to do uh, if you can't perform those skills, those types of things. You really need to know your role, and that's going to be a significant part of the test. Um, promotion of safety, that's also a significant part. 22% of, of the questions on your test are going to be on safety. Now, safety is yours and the patients. So you're going to have a lot of questions on that. And one question that you're absolutely going to have on the state exam is about fire safety. So you're definitely going to have a question on fire safety, because if there's a fire in the facility, we don't have time to go look up what to do or ask somebody else. They need to know that you know exactly what to do. If a fire were to break out right here, right now, what would you do? And the answer is going to be R-A-C-E, race. R is for remove the patient or rescue. A is for sound the alarm, let somebody know. C is to contain the fire. So we close the door, we block it off, we don't want it to spread anywhere. And E is for extinguish if you feel safe to do so. But extinguish is way, 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 way down on the list. Very first thing we do when there's a fire is remove the patients. Got to get them out of the way. Got to get them out of the area. And that makes sure that the patients, no matter what else happens, remain safe. So fire safety is going to be a question on your state exam. The third category, which is 20%, um, is promotion of function and health. So this is, okay, we have patients. How do we keep them healthy? How do we keep them from degrading? Because guys, when you're sick, it's really easy to go downhill if you're if we're not doing things to kind of um, promote your health. So that's going to be a part of what your what the is on the written test. Twenty four percent, which is like a quarter of the test, is on skills. Okay, it's just this is what most people focus on: our skills. And it takes up about a quarter of your written test, 24%. And then the last smallest piece is on providing specialized care for residents with changes. So this is where you're going to find those um, questions on dementia and Parkinson's and congestive heart failure. And, um, you know, if you have a patient that appears to be having difficulty breathing, 
um, before leaving to go let the nurse know what is an appropriate action. And you probably would want to get them into a sitting position because that makes it a little bit easier to breathe while you're trying to get help. So the, but that's the smallest part. Now, a lot of people focus on that. They get into anatomy and physiology, medical terminology. They cover all of this material and that's not what's on the test. I mean, that's only 14%, which equates to be about seven questions on the test. So if you're focusing all of your time and energy on disease processes and medical terminology and all of that, and you've missed the other four things, <laughs> you're probably not going to do well. So the original question was, how many can you miss and still pass? Well, you have to pass each section. So remember I said there's five sections. You have to pass each section. So if there's 11 questions in that section, you can't miss any more than four in that section. So it, every section, even though the test is graded as a whole, every section has to be passed in order to get a passing grade. So if you take that um, safety category for a second, right, 22%. Big part. If you take that safety category and there's 15 or 14 questions in the safety category, how many, you know, could you miss? Well, if you miss more than six or more uh, safety questions, doesn't matter if you ace the rest of it, you will not pass. So it, it, there's no hard number. I can't tell you, well, you can miss six questions on the state exam and pass. It's not like that. You have to pass each section. Now, this clinical skills is graded in a similar fashion because every single step is going to have a different weight to it. So some steps are going to be more important than others. For instance, if you're brushing somebody's teeth and you don't sit them up, they could choke. That's an important step. So forgetting to put the head of the bed up, that alone will fail you because there's a consequence to the patient. Now, if you forget to put a towel on their chest, they get some toothpaste on, your, on their clothes. It's not that critical. Nobody's died from toothpaste on their clothes. So it's not that critical. So that point would not count as much. So everything is going to be on a weighted scale. So unfortunately, I can't tell you, okay, you can mix, miss X amount of things on the written test or X amount of things on the skills test and still pass. It's not that simple. I hope that helps you guys. So let's see who's here today. I see a lot of hellos and waves. So Ramses Theodore, hi, Voodoo. Aw, thank you, Voodoo. Voodoo says she's super awesome. Thank you. You guys make my day. I love doing this every week. Kanisha says, hey, Miss Pat, I'm nervous about taking my state exam. Kanisha, that is totally normal. You should be nervous a little bit because that'll make you practice and that'll keep you sharp. So you should be nervous a little bit, um, but don't sweat it too much because if you get overwhelmed, if you get overly stressed, you're probably not going to um, do well on the test because now you know who you're focusing on? You're focusing on you. And in healthcare, it's not about us. It's always about the patient. So when you're taking the test, if you can remember that one saying, it's not about me, it's about the patient. If you can remember that, then you'll do better. Because instead of focusing on you and your nerves and your stress and you, 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 you'll start to focus on the patient and you'll look at them. Do they look safe? Do they look comfortable? Do they know what I'm doing? If you start to focus on the patient, you'll automatically do much better on the state exam because now you're focusing in the right place. So being a little bit nervous, that's okay, Kanisha. Try not to be too nervous, though. Just keep your focus on the patient. So Rotha, Ralpha, Rotha, I'm not sure how to say your name. I'm so sorry. Uh, it says live from Kansas. So thanks for joining us from Kansas. Sorry, guys, I'm thirsty. <laughs> Shirley says, hello. Hello, Shirley. Marley's here. Hi, Marley. Uh, Ketley says, hello. Hi. Stephanie says, hello. Hi, Stephanie. I like the way you spelled your name. That's cute. Yalitza. 
where do I have to go to switch my New York license to Alabama? Okay. What you have to do is contact the Board of Nursing in Alabama. Now, what you really need is the CNA registry. Some states, that's through the Board of Nursing, like here in Florida, our Board of Nursing regulates the um, uh, re state registry for CNAs. Other states, outside companies manage their registry. So you need to contact the Board of Nursing in Alabama and say, hey, I'm a New York CNA. I want to be an Alabama CNA. And they'll tell you the next step to take from there. You'll have to contact the registry. You'll have to find out their requirements. It probably will cost you a little bit of money. There's always a fee involved. And you'll probably have to take a background check as well. Um, so you'll have to, to contact them to start that process. But Anytime you want to move to another state, you start by contacting the state board of nursing that you want to move to. Find out their requirements and who you have to contact and then, um, you know, fulfill those requirements. And you can hold certifications in multiple states. And this is uh, this is helpful if you're going to be a travel CNA. You can hold certifications in multiple states, but you're responsible for renewing those certifications in each state that you hold a certification in. And there's some requirements behind that. So you have to check those out as well. Um, let's see here, Jonathan, hello. Queen Lily Vlogs, hi. I like those little hearts, those are cute. Stephanie says, do you think it's likely for employers to hire a CNA who can only work one day a week? Yes, <laughs> right now we are so short staffed everywhere that if you are upright and breathing and hold a CNA certification, if they can only get you for one day a week, they'll take it because that what they'll do is probably put you into a um, slot where you're covering somebody else. Um, so yeah, they're, they're probably, because everybody is so short staffed, they're just willing to you know, to fill in anywhere they can. So don't let that, don't let your availability um, affect your, your, um, application, make sure that you apply. You might want, you might find that, um, different settings have, uh, different requirements. So if you're going to go to work at a hospital, the pool, the hospital pool is a good place for you. I'm not talking about a swimming pool, you know, where you're swimming. The pool means it's a group of individuals that they call to fill in when openings exist, when they don't have enough of the regularly scheduled staff. So you would work in the pool, which means that you're probably not going to work on the same floor every single week or the same unit. You're probably going to be rotating around. But if you're working one day a week, the pool would be the best place for you. Um, home care might be a good option. Assisted living might be a good option, but even places like, uh, walk-in clinics, urgent care centers, those might be a good option too, because they may have an increased need on the weekends or, um, something like that. So be creative when you're looking for your jobs. Yalitza says, hi. Voodoo says, I got to get back to work. See you Monday, Miss Patty. Aw, thank you, Voodoo. I'm so glad to see you. Uh, Stephanie says, I passed my CNA state exam last Saturday. Congratulations, Stephanie. We're so excited. We want to welcome you to healthcare. Thanks for letting us know. Queen Lily says, I need to take the CNA test, but some people's make me scared because my English is not very well. Okay. I understand that. I do. Um, you're not, when you take the test, they're grading you on communication just to the point of being able to explain to the patient what you're doing. So if you can communicate well enough that the patient understands what you're trying to do so you can get permission, that's all they're looking for. Your English doesn't have to be perfect. When you take the test, it doesn't even have to be pretty. That's not what they're grading you on. But you do need to understand that what they're grading you on really does matter because when you get out there in a clinical setting, imagine for a second that you're sick and you're alone and you're in a strange place surrounded by strange people 
And this one stranger walks in the room and starts grabbing you and moving you. You're probably going to stiffen up because you're scared to death. You don't know what this person does. You don't know who they are. You don't know what they have planned. So your ability to communicate with patients is very, very important. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you do have to be able to get your point across. I hope that helps you. Um, so let's see here. Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Says, Miss Patty, please. I want to know when taking the written exam, how many questions can you miss to pass? All right, Jonathan, I actually just answered that question at the very beginning of this um, lesson today. So I know you just jumped in and you probably missed most of it. So go back and watch it. It'll be you'll be able to replay this. You can go back and watch it. But it's not as simple as saying um, you can miss, you know, X number of questions and still pass because there's five categories they're grading you on and you have to pass every single one of those categories. You have to know your role. You have to know safety. You have to know how to promote health um, with your patients. You have to know skills and you have to know how to work with residents that have changes in their condition. So all five of those categories are going to be important. Um, and you're going to have to pass each one of those categories. Now, I go over that in detail earlier in the, the lesson. So go back and watch that and it'll help explain that. So Flo says, hello, Miss Patty. Is there a blood pressure skill on the state exam? Okay, Flo. Um, it depends what state you're in. If you're testing in a prometric state, so there's 14 prometric states. If you're testing with prometric, blood pressure is not tested on the state exam. Other states still have blood pressure as a tested skill. So it depends on where you're at. And to be honest with you, I don't know the testing standards for every single state out there. So you'll want to look up the testing standards for your specific state. Now, on my website, I actually have on foryourcna.com under after certification, I actually have all of the CNA registries there. And I, when you link over to, there, there's a, a link in there that'll send you to your testing agency and you can look at the um, candidate handbook to find out. Marley says, I passed my skills, but failed the written. Any tips? Marley, the... Yes, for the written, there, there's a couple of tips I would give you. The first tip is know your role. And it, it's, it's, it's easy for me to say that, but most CNA um, programs don't cover this adequately. You truly need to know your role. CNAs follow the care plan, the whole care plan, nothing but the care plan. And they report everything that they observe to the nurse. That is your role. You do not make decisions. If you catch yourself making a decision in any way, it's the wrong answer. So you have to know your role. CNAs, um, there's a lot of questions on the written exam that are designed to trip you up if you don't know your role. So that's a really, really big part of it. The other thing is that you never, ever, ever choose a, an answer that treats a patient like a child. So if you've got two capable adults arguing in the TV room over what channel to watch, you can't make one of them leave or turn the TV off and insist that they do puzzles or restrict their you know, TV viewing to what you want them to watch. Though they're adults, they're allowed to bicker over what's on TV. As long as they remain calm, they can work it out. But you don't treat adults like children. And a lot of people get those questions wrong. A lot of people. Um, so those are the two big pieces of, of advice I would give you for the written test. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Yelitsa says, wow, okay. Because I got hired at the hospital for CNA in Alabama. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you so much. Very good. Um, that's awesome that you got a CNA job in Alabama. You need to, to make sure that you can get certified in Alabama, though, because uh, the hospital may not have, you know, taken that step. So definitely check into that. 
not all states will grant you a certification based on the fact that you have one somewhere else. Most states do, but not all. So I would definitely check with Alabama. Uh, let's see here. Blue. Hi, Blue. The nursing staffing agency in my town is begging for CNAs. One day a week, part-time, on-call, full-time, can only work nights. If you have a CNA license and can pass the background check, you're hired. Absolutely. I couldn't say it better myself. Absolutely. They will take you however they can get you because they, the need is so great out there. Uh, Alaska Pat says, thank you for the info about CNAs having the ability to hold licenses in multiple states. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, um, you know, travel CNAs is becoming a thing. And this is um, actually relatively not new, but it's becoming more accepted. When I talk a lot, my mouth gets dry. It becomes more, it's becoming more accepted because the need is so great. It used to be that there were um, mostly well-staffed, right? But some pockets here and there that had staffing needs. So, you know, you would see a contract occasionally for like North Dakota or Kansas or Texas or maybe even New York. And, um, you know, you could apply and and to, to a travel agency and they would send you to those places. But travel CNA just wasn't as well-known, as popular as it has become. Since COVID happened, um, there are people that are making good money, experienced CNAs that are making very good money going to high demand places. And these places have, have tried to hire locally. They've said, listen, we have openings. We need help here. We'll offer you money, but we have patients that we have to take care of. If we don't have enough staff, we've got to import. I mean, it's just that simple. So if you're importing staff, that's going to cost a whole lot more money because staffing agencies are not cheap and they have to pay for your travel and your lodging and give you a food stipend and all of that to get those, those positions filled. So travel CNA has become a really, really big thing in the last two years where it was kind of marginalized before. It's now becoming um, very, very popular. And it's a way to make uh, very, very good money as a CNA. But, you know, there are some negatives to it, too. And everybody focuses on the money. And that's great. I understand that. I have bills to pay, too. I get it. But we have to think about what a CNA is and what CNAs do, right? We're way, we're way, way more than just bed baths and peri care. That, that's, that, CNAs do that, but that's not what CNAs do. That's the best way for me to put it. CNAs are there to really monitor for changes and, and notice things about the patients, to report those things to the nurse. If you're there bathing and dressing and grooming and toileting and feeding and turning the patients, you get to know these patients because you're spending the most amount of time with them. You get to know them as well as you know you know, friends and family, you get to know them. Well, the nurses don't spend that much time with the patients. They're in there to give pills, to do treatments, and then they're out. So the nurses don't know the patients nearly as well as the CNAs do. So we really rely on the CNAs that are doing the bathing and the grooming and the dressing and the feeding and the toileting. We really rely on you to let us know when Henry looks a little wonky. Or when Martha's a little more confused today than normal. Well, if we don't have the same staff working with the patients all the time, we've lost a significant amount of information. And that means things are going to get missed. Nobody's going to recognize that Martha's a little more confused today because nobody knows what Martha is normally like. So we lose the ability to really assess our patients well and intervene early, which means things get missed. And that is, it has a negative impact on our patients. So although I understand the need for travel CNAs, I mean, hey, those spots need to be filled. Those patients need care. But ideally, we need to have, look a little closer to home and get into positions where we 
can work with the same patients every day so we can get to know them. And we will recognize when Martha is just a little bit more confused today than normal. And that might indicate a urinary tract infection that we can intervene quickly. We can get a urine sample, get it tested, get her on antibiotics, and then she doesn't get septic and die, which is important. So even though agency CNAs are in demand and you can make good money at it, um, just remember what CNAs are actually supposed to be doing. CNAs are supposed to be the ones that develop those long-term relationships with the patients to be able to let the nursing staff know when something is horribly wrong. And I think we're missing that along the way. All right. So let's see here. Um, Pixel Fight. Pixel Fight. That's a cool name. Hi. Only thing I was confused about when you do the skills, you never wear gloves. No, that's actually, uh, that's actually not true. I do wear gloves for several skills. The thing about it is that gloves are not skill specific. I just talked to my class about this yesterday. When it comes to gloves, gloves are always based on the patient, not the skill. So let me give you an example. Let's say that we're going to do range of motion to a hip, knee, and ankle on a patient who is fully clothed, completely con continent, and lying in bed. Well, I have no exposure to body fluids in that case. So I don't need gloves. I can do range of motion to a hip, knee, and ankle on somebody that is fully clothed and continent without gloves. I'll wash my hands before, I'll wash my hands after, but I don't need gloves to do the skill. Now, same skill, range of motion, hip, knee, and ankle, but I'm going to do this on a patient who is only wearing a hospital gown, no undergarments, and is incontinent. Now, my risk of encountering body fluids is high, so I would need gloves. So it's not based on the skill. It's based on the patient you're going to do the skill on. Now, for my videos that you see online, those are testing scenarios. So I'm demonstrating this on a testing student in a testing environment. So this person is fully dressed and holding on to all of their own body fluids for the majority of the skills. So gloves are not necessary. Some skills that I'm demonstrating on the videos have exposure to body fluids or personal skin. And in those skills, you will see me wearing gloves. Skills like mouth care and denture care, peri care, partial bed bath, catheter care, bedpan. Um, trying to think of what else. Uh, emptying the drainage bag. All those skills you will see me wearing gloves for. I hope that helps. I have a whole video on my website. If you go to foryourcna.com, click on training in the top menu, and then animated lessons, go watch the lesson on gloves, puzzle it out glove rules, and that'll help explain that to you. Blue says, if you need to take the test in your native language, Prometric is good about that, but you need to give them enough notice to get an interpreter. Okay, so let me talk about that for a second, Blue. Um, Prometric testing is only the written test. So I'm going to talk about the written first is only given in two languages, English and Spanish. That's it. Those are the only two languages that um, is authorized for Prometric CNA written test. So Creole is not um, eligible for, you, you can't have the um, test translated into Creole for the written test. The skills must be completed in English. There is no wiggle room there, must be completed in English. And that is, um, that is a testing, that is a, uh, board of Nursing Testing Requirement. So um, let's see here, Alaska. But oh, one, one thing that you can do, though, Queen, um, is that you can, one of the things when you're signing up for the test, you can get earphones and the computer can actually read the question to you. Now, it'll either be read in English or Spanish, you know, whichever language you wish. But the computer can read the question to you. And that's very helpful if English is not your first language, because you may understand verbal English better than written English. 
So I always recommend to people who where English is not their first language that they get the audio component for the written test. Um, so let's see here. Alaska, Pat says that was well said. Well, thank you. I'm glad you helped that. Um, so Queen says, uh, Blue Jedi, thanks, but I don't think so. If I can take it in Creole, it's very difficult. Yeah, unfortunately, it, it's not offered in Creole. Um, so let's see here. What skills do you see CNAs do wrong the most or seem to rush through the most? Uh, this, the skills that I see failed the most often are pulse because the care plan clearly states to count for one full minute. And most people will count for 15 seconds and multiply that by four. And that's perfectly okay to do in a clinical setting, as long as the care plan doesn't call for a one minute count. But there's a reason that the nurse wants a full minute count on the pulse. There's a reason she has that in the care plan. So if you go in and the care plan says one full minute and you're just doing a quick count and multiplying that by four to get your minute reading, that is not what you were asked to do. So that will fail you. So pulse is a very frequently failed skill on the state exam. Another skill that's failed somewhat often is a uh, bedpan because people don't put the head of the bed up and women cannot pee uphill. So putting the head of the bed up is actually a very important step. Emptying the drainage bag is also a commonly failed skill because people contaminate the emptying port. When you're emptying the drainage bag, you cannot let that port touch anything nothing, not your gloves, not the bag, not the cup, not the chucks, not the bed, nothing. So that one, because it's a little more technical, does get failed quite a bit. Another one uh, that I do see failed uh, somewhat frequently is transferring from bed to wheelchair because they either don't put shoes on the patient or they don't use a gate belt or the wheelchair isn't locked when they go to put them in. So um, I see those failed quite a bit. And I cover all of that in my training. If you go watch my classroom lectures on these, you'll see I address every single one of those and why they're important to pay attention to. Um, Melissa says, good day, Nurse Patty and everyone. Well, good day. So let's get to who passed this week, other than Stephanie. Congratulations. So Kevin Advencula let us stop by our YouTube channel to let us know that um, he passed the state exam. We're super excited. Rosemary Powell also let us know that she passed the CNA state exam. So welcome to healthcare. And Zenia Waves of Life also passed the CNA state exam. And I wasn't sure whether I had congratulated her or not. So we're going to include her again this week. So if I've congratulated you already, here's another congratulations to welcome you to healthcare. So great job, everybody. You guys are all doing fantastic. Um, Next week, we're going to have our lesson, same time, same place, Thursdays at three on our YouTube channel. And if you like, and I hate saying all this, but if you like and subscribe and ring the bell, YouTube will let you know when I go live. So it's just a simple button push and, and you're in. And that seems to be a little bit easier way for you to be able to connect when I go live. Um, so you might want to consider that if you have not already. Um, recruit your friends. Let others know that we do this every Thursday. The more, the merrier. And uh, next week, we'll do this same time, same place. I'm working on a plan for the following week, though, because it is Thanksgiving. We're two weeks away from Thanksgiving. i got to go buy a turkey. Um, so I'm not real sure what to do about Thanksgiving. My house is going to be a madhouse. I'm going to have probably 30 people here. So it's going to be very, very chaotic. And I don't know that I'll be able to uh, lock myself away and meet with you guys for 30 minutes. So we may possibly um, move our thir regularly scheduled Thursday meeting to um, Wednesday of that week. But I'm still playing around with ideas. If you guys have any ideas, let me know. Think about it over the week. Let me know next week what your preference is. And before we sign off, I want to take just a moment to... 
thank all of our veterans that uh, served in the armed forces, all of the families that supported the veterans that served in the armed forces. And I want to say a very, very heartfelt thank you for your service. Without your service, we can't do what we like to do, and that's care for others. So you keep us safe. And for that, we are very, very grateful. So to all of our veterans, thank you very, very much. Enjoy today. And I'll see you guys next week. Until next time, happy caregiving.